the robes and shaving your head and getting up. Is on. And getting up like five Sorry. times uh, in the middle of the night for prayer, right? Um, but you still adhere to the same sort of belief as the layman Christian. Right? And this is kind of how I see cynics and the Stoics because they build on the same foundation. Um, the idea that um, only virtue is good and only vice is evil. Um, but where, this, uh, where, where, where the cynics are entirely black and white about those concepts, and they don't allow for any um, sort of room of interpretation. If something is not virtuous, if something is not good, then by definition, it is bad and it is vicious and it's evil. Um, where um, stoicism sort of uh, is sort of um, like taking a step back from this very extremist uh, point of view and moves a little bit more to the um, pure Socratic kind of uh, view, um, sort of as a, as a middle ground and acknowledges the fact that, okay, we are not perfect and we live in, you know, uh, a society and um, we have to deal with the, the gray area and the nuances of life. And so we, um, you know, we, we cannot everybody, uh, not every, not, not everyone is in a position where we can say, okay, we, reject money because money is not inherently good, therefore this evil. Like it's not something that we can realistically hope to achieve in our lives. So we have to deal with it. So we have to find a category for it. And the category is the category of indifference. It affords us the possibility to do good things if we use it wisely. Um, it affords us the um, temptation or it, it tempts us to use it poorly as well. Um, so adding this category of indifference, I think is the main um, uh, yeah, the main differentiator and the more um, real life um, usability and the real life compatibility of stoicism over cynicism. Um, but I'm really, really intrigued by what you said, Tony, about the, the shamelessness, right? Because um, ultimately, um, uh, their pattern of behavior um, that you both referenced, um, they're, um, they're not inherently linked to any, um, you know, good or bad. It's some, something of like, I would really like to find out and, and, and understand what the justification for it is. Like, okay, uh, Diogenes of um, Diogenes of Sinope, the cynic, um, he was like uh, always antagonizing people, but to what end, right? Um, I'm actually really intrigued to find out um, more about this. Yeah. Um... Yeah, actually, to, to 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 keep on point with this idea of shamelessness, I also I I and I, I'm only getting the idea now that it, it kind of is ironic, almost to a point, because what um, when Tony talked about shamelessness, and then on top of that, you mentioned um, Diogenes going ahead and and and, and tackling people, Philip, uh, uh, on on how shameful they should be for what they're doing. You know, that's almost ironic in a sense, or. Um, um, I, I wouldn't call it um, hypocritical because they're not exactly like they're not accusing other people for doing what they're doing, um, but they are. It is an ironic way of living because they're they're trying to act shameless, but they're accusing other people for being. They're, they actually they they should make a point for other people to like who should be shameful for what they're doing. Actually, I think a good example of this is when um, Crates. Um, the cynic was teaching Zeno, and uh, Zeno's this the the, the story. Um, if um, if uh, maybe one or two of you have definitely read this, but for those who haven't read it, the when Crates is teaching Zeno to hold a cup of soup, um, and Zeno's a, you know weary of doing it because of how he'll look to other people, and then um, uh, Crates hits the cup onto the onto the ground. Um, uh, He's almost as if he, he's almost he's not just teaching Zeno to be shameless for anything that he's doing. He's also teaching Zeno to be shameful for um, for having too much. I feel like he's um, uh, they're, they're the extent to which they're minimalist and kind of and are, are against any kind of externals is almost the opposite of indifferent to me. Where the Stoics were indifferent to externals, the Cynics seemed completely opposed to externals, and that's very different than indifferent. Um, 
And I actually think that's anti-Stoic. I think you're right, Philip. You're, you're touching on a point that's very, like it actually is a huge distinction. The shamelessness, this is a huge distinction between cynicism and Stoicism because it's not just kind of a fix to it that Stoics did with the notion of indifference. It's almost like the anti, like the opposite of what the cynics thought. Interesting. Um, just something while you were talking just occurred to me and I've, um, yeah, like, like literally just now that I never really thought about this. And um, Stoics were always, um, you know, encouraged to participate in the in the public life. Um, and we talked about this before in contrast to Epicureans, where they would actively withdraw from from the public life as a source of um, uh, upset and discomfort and and, and whatnot. Um, interestingly, I'm not aware of any cynic politician or a cynic. Um, I don't know person of, of uh, influence beyond um, the philosophy. Right? There's Crates, there's Diogenes, there's probably some others that I've never heard of, but um, while there are um, yeah, historic statesmen, um, I, don't, I don't know of a cynic um, that would fit that bill. Um, so that's, that's interesting. I don't believe that they had any desire for public office whatsoever. I think they were slightly embarrassed the whole notion of it really um they would rather sort of cause consternation and um and, and you know, sort of ill feeling i think um rather than just try to govern a place or form any sort of authoritarian aspect of society um yeah so the, the completely different than stoicism because obviously the, the great stoics Marx aurelius has been the most notable um a great statesman but I've never heard, of, and I actually thought of that yesterday. I've never heard of any cynic who rose to public office in any way. And I don't really know why, other than the fact that they held the whole notion of it in consternation. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm, I'm sure that's um, that's part of it. But I don't think it's. Um, I think it's a. Um, I don't think it's necessarily part of the cynic philosophy. It's just a consequence of it. Um, if you know what I mean, where as part of the stoic philosophy is um, you embrace your role and you play it to your best to the best of your abilities, and that means taking responsibility. There's nothing in the in the cynic philosophy in and of itself that says like um, don't take uh, part in public life as it does with Epicureanism, but it's just a consequence of their worldview that um, uh, that has this as a consequence, right? It's not it's it's not a tenet. Of cynicism that uh, that you shouldn't do it. It's just it just works out that way if you if you live to it. It's interesting. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think there's actually an aversion to public life once they get to it. Like I remember reading the way Crates himself became a cynic was that he was a wealthy merchant like Zeno, except. Unlike Zeno, who accidentally became poor and destitute, like he cra he crashed a ship, everything was lost. Crates, optionally, he voluntarily gave away his wealth to become an ascetic, to become a cynic. So there's a comp like there's a complete difference in which Zeno kind of was forced into his philosoph into his philosophical attitude, whereas Crates optionally went there. And I wonder, I don't know, maybe maybe that has, and I don't think we'll ever know, but maybe that had a huge effect on the way in which those philosophies went down their own respective roads. I did, the only thing I can say is that when I was, I read the entire Wikipedia and um, like Stanford encyclopedia of, of philosophy pages on cynicism, the only reference I can find to a person of power was this, and I forget his name, This it was an emperor, I believe it was, um, uh, I. I don't, I think it was a, um, might have been a Byzantine emperor. Um, it was, uh, I don't know if it was Byzantine or, or still Roman Empire. It was two or 300 AD. And he found, um, uh, he found a liking in cynicism. Um, but to the extent that he, he ultimately left political life. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily the case. Like, I think, I think there's actually like, um, uh, there seems to be this weird pattern of them just relinquishing all material wealth um, for the purpose of living an ascetic life. 
um, which to an extent is honorable. Like I, I do, I do understand. Like maybe to catch up on another point, I do understand. Like Epictetus has this whole section of one of his discourses when he actually um, kind of paints an homage to cynicism, and I do, do get it. Why? Like they, they are like, when to an extent, like you do kind of feel like they're um, virtuous or at least holding a lot of integrity. I mean, to do all that, to to give up all your material wealth. I mean, in like today's society, we we basically praise Gandhi. We, we praise these aesthetics for relinquishing all material wealth for the purpose of, um, or um, uh, um, uh, monks who, um, uh, famous monks who end up, um, uh, um, there's a specific word in English, I, re I really forget it, burning themselves to death in protest. You know, these, these famous ascetics who walk this unmaterialistic life for the benefit of um, protesting or for living virtuously, you kind of honor them in a certain way. Um, but um, uh, it's, uh, I think, so I, 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 can't, I can't, like, as much as, as much as we find these disadvantages to cynicism, I can't, I can't find, Epicureanism is a different story, but for cynics, I can't find a reason why I would think somebody shouldn't become a cynic. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, I, I would always find for myself a way to argue stoicism over cynicism, but um, immolation, thank you, Philip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your English is better than mine. <laughs> Hardly. I just, have a, I just have a terrible taste in music. And um, it's like, I know all these weird, obscure words because I listened to lots of death metal when I was younger. And they all have like these yeah, weird, obscure band names and album names and song titles. So yeah, like that, that's why. <laughs> There's actually an album, I forget by whom, um, with a picture of uh, for the smoke oh, yeah. emulating uh, on the front. Yeah, yeah it's a uh, Rage Against the Machine. Ah, it's the one. Yeah. I can't name a single song of theirs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also the name of a band, but they're like a little bit more extreme than Rage Against the Machine. Um, so, yeah, um, to um, to come back to your point, Steve, um, I think Epictetus is a, is an interesting example because as, if, if you look at like, um, the whole litany of, of uh, Stoic um, philosophers over the ages. I think he is probably the one who would, um, like, if, if you imagine on a spectrum, you know, like, it, it's not like there's the one unified school. They all have different ideas and, and emphasize different um, things. He would probably be the one um, that I would say leans the closest towards um, cynicism. Like, the way that he often references, like you said as well, like, the way that he often makes reference to them almost like they're um, revered by him, you know, um, as if he would almost um, would have, um, I don't want to say that he would have liked to be a cynic, but he, he definitely holds them in, in very high regard. And like you said, he's, he, he sees um, their integrity and he sees that um, the way that, that, that they behave um, is very much in accord with um, their values so they're not duplicit in that in that sense um yeah interesting um i just i'm just interested to know who read um that one of the links i posted was a an essay on a, sh a short essay a short essay by massimo piliucci on his blog um, i was wondering who read that uh, you, if, you, if you guys have read that okay um well, for one, for one thing, I thought it, I, I thought it interesting. Whenever I read a, an essay by Massimo Piliucci, he's one of the more um, assertive writers in Stoic in Stoic contributions. Whenever I, it's it's interesting, it's so funny. When I read Donald Robertson, it's much more measured. But when I read Massimo Piliucci, there's there's kind of like he makes these um, sarcastic or or blunt remarks about some some somebody, which. Um, I guess that's some flavor to reading reading these different modern uh, stoic philosophers. Um, but reading it, he had a real, and I, I don't think he's necessarily saying, you know, Epictetus was a bad person or did, didn't 
make any contributions to Stoicism on the contrary. But I think it was really interesting. He had a really harsh take on Epictetus's homage to cynicism. He actually hated it. He actually didn't understand why Epictetus was paying this homage to cynicism or painting them in a good light. Like he thought it was the way in which Epictetus was living this very harsh version of Stoicism, almost akin to cynicism, this um, this uh, like rock solid, um, living in poverty, harsh, like stoic training day to day. He didn't like, he didn't think it was in the name of promoting a, the, the new stoic philosophy as opposed to cynicism. He didn't think it was really advantageous to do that. Um, and it was a very harsh take. Um, I, but I, I think it's, it's not necessarily, I mean, to an extent, maybe the argument is there that it could in a sense promote other or advocate for other people living to that extreme when stoicism doesn't necessarily promote that on the other side i don't think like i said before i don't think stoics would necessarily stop people from living like that it's almost like what you said philip when you also mentioned or maybe tony now i forget at this point a few 10 minutes back when somebody said living in accordance with your role um uh, this is different from cynicism, which basically said to abandon your role, to live in un, un, an unmaterialistic ascetic life. You know, I don't think, I think Stoics would uphold you if you had found yourself destitute or if you found yourself to be, to truly be an ascetic or to want to live in a community of ascetics, for example. I think it's completely within reason if you want to go ahead and do that. You know, it's just um, live in accordance with what you, you want to do. Um, uh, to an extent, there's a there's a point to which doing anything you want to do is unethical, but um, I think it's within reason that it's, um, it's it might also be good for the philosophy. I, I see I see your hand, Adam. Uh, just my last word on this is that it might be good for the philosophy to have different perspectives. Like Epictetus is the, the, the harshly trained Stoic philosopher. Um, Seneca, I would actually t maybe consider as one, you know, out of the big three to be kind of the converse. He's Epictetus was the slave who harshly trained in, in Stoicism every day. Seneca did not harshly train. I mean, sometimes he slept on the floor, but like to the extent that's opposite, that, that's that's like Epictetus who's a slave who has to live in poverty all his life, that's very different. Um, uh, so I think it's good we have those very two different characters. Um, Philip. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure um, if I agree entirely with your point about um, that a um, the, from a stoic perspective, it would be um, permissible uh, to live the life that you want. Like this, and and that's not saying anything about you know the world that we live in today. I'm mean, like purely talking about the um, historical um, record that we have because there's there's examples of um, uh, the I can't I can't get it together um, how the argument went, but it's basically you have these circles of um, around you, right? So you have a responsibility to the innermost circle, which is your family, right? And if you're not the, the part of familias in the society, then that means that, uh, or in your innermost circle, if you're not the head of the family, so to say, um, that means that your, your first and foremost duty is towards your family. So um, saying that, um, you know, you, you, you could do um, as you wish would violate your responsibility towards um, the first circle. And then the next circle up would be, you know, your larger community, let's say your, um, your province or your city and then your country and then the world as a whole. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure if a, a stoic would have um, agreed with that statement, at least not in ancient times. And again, it's like the world that we live in today is entirely different and those circles um, probably don't really um, exist that uh, that strongly anymore, and we kind of make our own communities and our own circles, um, and so we we shape the world around us, and we move much more freely um, from one circle to the other, and we choose the circle that fits us. So we can um, we can choose to live um, much more freely in the world that we want, and we can choose to say, okay, I'm going to transplant myself into a circle that um, allows me to live the life that I want, where I think um, traditionally and historically it um, wouldn't have been um, possible. 
think you made a good point. I made a I might have broadened the 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 idea. I think the think the Stoics are trying to are trying to pitch too broadly. Um, in fact, I think I think what I said was more cynic. You know, because the cynics were against social norms um, vehemently, like they thought that you should just abandon social norms. I think they would be more likely to agree with the statement: live in any way, shape, or form you want. Um, but even even there, I think I think any philosophy is is restrictive. I think any philo like for the cynics, you know, live in any to, to to live in accordance with your own nature to the extent that you don't hold material possessions beyond what you need. You know, so there's always a restraint. There's always a threshold. I think for the Stoics, there's that too. Um, uh, but. It's a really interesting question, actually. Now you now you have me really interested in this in this interest. So, for example, I'll I'll pitch, I'll pitch this question to you guys, and I'll focus on the idea of indifference and stoicism, um, which might help us to answer this question. So, um, the stoic idea is that you should be indifferent to anything external, which generally means you, it shouldn't affect your ability to be virtuous. Um, doesn't necessarily mean to discard them. So if you have a choice between healthcare and no healthcare, choose healthcare. If you have a choice between um, some health, to, uh, some some sorry, wealth to give you a roof over your head and, and food on your table, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, to go for a beer once a week for your friends out out um, on the streets, that's fine. Um, and then they have this. Uh, um, but the the question I'm asking is: Is it necessary? So, for example, if you have the different, if you have a choice between, um, uh, um, let's say, let's, I think healthcare is a bit more of an easier question to answer. I think, I think we would ultimately that that that's I think um, uh, would prompt us too easily in one direction versus another. Let's say healthy foods. Let's say um, uh, you have a choice between uh, ordering a pizza one night versus. Um, you already have, let's say, you already have in, in your in your cabinets a um, um, some beans, some vegetables, and um, uh, if you eat meat, uh, a, a steak. Um, what would um, I mean? What is would a stoic necessarily say? You're being anti-stoic for choosing that pizza or the healthy food. So what I'm asking is: Are indifference or are those preferable indifference? necessary to choose if you have, if, if they are at your option, um, or if you refuse to choose them for non, more, like, like less preferable indifference, um, would that mean you're being anti-Stoic? Or do Stoics allow you to choose things that are less preferable? It's an interesting question because I'm not sure if, I'm not sure I can really pinpoint a, a quote or a line that, that says where a Stoic would necessarily say it's necessary for you to choose the indifferent external that is preferable when it is when it is at your option. Yeah, to, to me, that sounds more like some notion of harsh minimalism and stoicism. You know, minimalism has become very popular now. I have a friend who, not to the point of Diogenes, but he, he really won't um, have anything that he doesn't need at all. And I think, you know, if we take a beer, we have a pizza, it's, surely it's just part of an innocent pleasure. I think if it becomes something which is becomes damaging, so if you eat pizza every night of the week and you're ruining your health, or if you choose alcohol to drink that every every night or whatever, and you're damaging your, your own health, I think that's something which you shouldn't be indifferent about. You should actually be quite um, serious about. But um, as long as you're not damaging yourself or anyone else, I would say personally, it's absolutely fine. See, the, the, the issue is with going too far with any sort of, you know, thought process or philosophy is that it can become sort of evangelistic in a way. You know, you, you can become self-righteous um, when I think we all need to maintain an element of personal freedom um, within sensible boundaries. Yeah. I was unsure at first, but what you said like right off the bat convinced me. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, um, like at, at first I was like the same as you, so you trying to think of like, hmm, is there something that I can you know recall from memory where somebody would have said something um, along those lines? Um, the, the main thought that I had is that um, 
indifference are not, um, as far as I know, um, like ranked. I don't think there's anything that's, or maybe they are, I don't know. But, um, you know, something that is more preferable or less uh, indifferently, but preferable over the other. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, um, uh, something that's ever get talk, gets talked about much. Um, but yeah, like I said, what you, what you said straight off the bat, um, as long as it's um, within uh, within reason, um, it's um, it's fine, and it's actually it, um, may, maybe the common English um, uh, term for this would be it's it's the what is it the habit that makes the poison or something like that. I don't know how the how the proverb goes, but um, it's it's exactly that. If it's an exception, um, it's accepted acceptable but the yeah the example of like drinking uh alcohol every day and eating pizza every day um that's absolutely where this this turns around and it becomes problematic um i don't think there's anything that um would speak against the occasional you know um letting loose actually um Cato, uh you know famously strict with everyone and himself um was particularly fond of uh drinking at the end of the day having you know his friends get together and uh, apparently he liked to get quite drunk uh during those meetups so um so even even the harshest uh, the most strict um of the bunch um you could say um yeah sometimes sometimes stepped a little bit over the line i think uh it's a good meetup idea you should um, <laughs> uh, maybe have a have a Seneca evening and uh, talk about stoicism over a few beers. <laughs> um, it'll be an exceptional. It'll be it'll be an exception, exceptional, exceptionally exceptional exception of an evening for us to have, to drink a few beers over stoicism. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so I was thinking about him, by the way. I was I was trying to pinpoint whether it was. I, I don't know why it was Musonius Rufus who was uh, teaching Epictetus, or it was Seneca. But you're right; it was. I heard it was Seneca who got he he made it. He like he made the excuse that it was it was just to learn from other people. But you know, I think to an extent, when you get too drunk, you're just getting too drunk at that point. <laughs> so you're saying um, we'll have a we'll have a um, classic Greek symposium, and um, yeah, <laughs> nice. Um, there's 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 one um like anecdote it doesn't have anything to do with philosophy i i i really like this like little tidbit of historical fact is that um at the beginning of the night of the symposium of a, any symposium so supposedly it's basically just you know a greek get together um some food and, and drink and at the beginning of the night um the host would mix uh the water at uh, the wine with water like wine is not like we it was basically like a wine concentrate back in the days. So they would mix it because it was considered uncivilized to, to drink um, unadulterated wine, pure, like full strength wine. And um, there's lots of, um, like, uh, if you go through um, like some accounts of, of um, uh, yeah, historical symposia, um, people are talking about, you know, like, uh, oh, she, she was a, I, I can't remember who it was, but it was a, it was a, a woman. And um, she would always um, basically mix the wine all the way down to like a 10 to one wine or one part wine to 10 parts water because she was actually interested in the in the discussion with the people. And then there was like these hedonists that um, were put like, you know, a token amount of water in just so that they could say that oh, it's diluted, but not really. And they're just interested in getting drunk. Um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, this, aspect of um, indulging in few pleasures i think one idea could be could be that you only do that when you have really uh, completed a challenge like come on as as a humans we we love rewards right and and there's a human part of us and we can't avoid that so maybe on a day if you achieve something cool then yeah a drink and a pizza would be deserved <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and that would be quite a rational point of view of Stoic because we are always logical and rational. Yeah, go ahead, take it. You earned it. <laughs> that day, you, you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good uh, um, way of moderating yourself because you know you always have to like get through a, a period of challenge in order to get that reward. I think it's also a good incentive. Once you get that reward, you feel you don't feel like you have you can't get through the next challenge. You know the next challenge will always bring a reward afterwards, even if it's given it to yourself, right? If the challenge is not successful in a certain sense, you can always have that pizza or beer afterwards to uh, to reward yourself. Yeah. Um, um, there was another um, uh, there was another point of departure between cynicism and stoicism that that interested me. Uh, we talked over the the living accord with nature and indifference. There was another point of departure between them. Um, uh, but I don't think there's too many others. Actually, I don't think I don't think there had been too many others. There might be just details, like for example, the the big difference between um, cynics' opposition to social norms. And the Stoics' acceptance of some of them, um, to the extent that there are, there, there are, you know, it is within Stoic philosophy and written explicitly that um, you shouldn't necessarily care about other people's opinions as long as you are acting virtuously. Um, uh, so if you do have to break a social norm for that, that's okay. And in fact, I was um, um, reading something the other day, and it made me think. Um, they, it was a good article in, in, uh, on, a private, in a, on a privacy blog, and it kind of gave you a hypothetical situation. Um, what if um, one, you know, one hundred percent of law enforcement uh, or, or law enforcement was one hundred percent effective? And they argued that there would never be any social or law or legal change, legal changes in society, because the government wouldn't think anything's wrong. There's just if one law enforcement's one hundred percent effective, it's just not necessary to change anything anymore. So they made the argument that, for example, um, uh, for the longest time, even in the late 20th century, it was illegal in a, in certain, in a certain sense to teach or to um, uh, put visuals up in public display of um, homosexual, homosexual love. Um, and that took a lot of effort by people actually expressing that love or, you know, um, talking about it in public in order to break down those barriers. So um, that was just the example the, the article used, but I think you can basically stretch this any any which way to an extent. And um, uh, um, I lost my point now. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, um, I, about social norms, uh, I think to an extent the Stoics would, would agree that in order to make changes in society, you need to break some of that down a little bit. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good stoic example in the past. I was thinking about Cato's rebellion against Julius Caesar, but that's not a good one. He was actually, actually trying to stop change from happening. Um, maybe to an extent Marcus Aurelius is one um, in the sense that he was trying to stop his son from becoming the kind of emperor he was, but that didn't ultimately come to come to fruition. Um, but yeah, I think there's some, there's the more easier ones if you, if you, I didn't mean to put this in the, in the middle here because I, I, I don't mean to market this all the time, but actually um, uh, uh, Kai Whiting's new book actually has really good examples um, uh, of when more contemporary people like there is a um i forget his name there's a um, entrepreneur um in the u.s he made an example of who had in the in this century in the last decade he had um become this wealthy multimillionaire, and he essentially he was based in seattle where amazon is headquartered and he had fought and successfully fought it eventually passed for a 15 dollar minimum wage and but every, all of his friends hated it all of his other friends in the corporate sector hated it because they, 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 they thought that there'd be this huge exodus of exodus of businesses. There wasn't, but they, they so I, I think it's, um, that's a really good example when you break social norms and not care about it. Um, 
I think that's what makes stoicism more robust than cynicism. It's open for people from anybody. I think it's it's even it's even more than what you were talking about, Philip. I think uh, you started out talking about these circles uh, and where, where you where you fit in in terms of your roles, but I think it's also more about the fact that it even has those circles. I think for cynicism, necessarily can't like it can't necessarily discuss poli can't necessarily accept politicians or people of great wealth because that's against its own philosophy but i think it's a it makes good sense historically why stoicism was propagated so much throughout the roman elite and the roman poor because it was just it was so accessible to everybody and everybody could do it yeah and um, that's actually a very good um point that i didn't really think about that this uh, of necessity uh cannot exist in in cynicism um, I have one question um, that sort of, um, I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, um, but maybe it will, and I'd be super interested to hear about it. Um, do we know anything um, about uh, cynic um, cosmology? Like, you know, there's, um, if, you, if you look at, um, uh, you know, the stoic explanation of why the world is the way that it is and why we're trying to live in accordance with um, nature and reason and um, we know quite a lot about um, about those things but is there anything like this that we know about the relationship of the cynic to the natural world because I, I can't remember every ever reading anything about it but I also don't remember ever looking up actively so you're at, you're right though that um for, for, I mean I'm, I'm looking it up quickly now to see if there is anything um, maybe in another um, Kind of internet encyclopedia. What what I do know is that um, Zeno took some of the metaphysics from the Cynics and from the, from some of the Socratic um, uh, from, a, from from the Socratic pupils. So they're probably somewhat similar. Um, but for example, I do know that very strictly, it wasn't until a Stoic philosopher did this. It wasn't until Zeno um, that Zeno specifically broke things down into physics logic and ethics like these two these three main realms of philosophy i don't think the cynics i think there was an idea about that still ongoing i don't think he created it necessarily but i, I think i don't think the cynics focused on that so much as, as the stoics did um uh i cynics yeah it's weird the um it's very different like in in Stoicism, you always find um, uh, you always find those three sections. Actually, you always find something about Stoic logic, Stoic ethics, Stoic metaphysics. But I'm I'm looking up, and I just can't like everything I read was always about the Cynic ethical philosophy. Nothing nothing about it. Um, nothing about it metaphysically. I know that there's something we haven't touched upon, and it's because I just didn't read it as much. There is something about. Um, the Cynic idea of, of freedom and self-sufficiency. Um, but um, in terms of its metaphysics, that's a really good point. I don't, I don't read much. I haven't read much about it. Um, yeah, same. I, I just, while you were talking, I was just um, scanning the Wikipedia article on cynicism. And the only, like, even just a slight hint of it is, is a mention of them generally being skeptics, but that's more about um, epistemology, so knowing like what what can we know and how do we know that what we know is correct. Um, so as a skeptic, they would fall into the camp of saying, oh, we, we can't ever know anything for certain. Yeah. But it doesn't say anything about um, the relationship to um, to the world around them. That's right. It wasn't um, it wasn't Stanford. So actually, I had read I had read the summary on Wikipedia and on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, IEP. Um, but actually, I'm looking at, so another popular source is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. They have a really good section. They have a really good articles. Um, and for example, they have an entire article on Stoicism. They have an entire article on Epicureanism uh, or Epicurus. I can't, I'm typing in cynicism. They don't have an article on cynicism. In fact, when I type in cynicism, the first source that comes up related to the formal philosophy is Epictetus. <laughs> so there's there's not yeah there's not really a lot of research on cynicism like there is on stoicism. I I wonder if that's a research thing. I wonder if we just don't have the resources to look at that. 
Um, what I can, the only, like, I know the, the only more general metaphysical philosophy that most Greeks had back then was this idea that um, there's actually a name for it. And maybe you can get a, give it a, 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 again, Philip. Um, there's this Greek name for the universe um, beginning and ending that they thought that the universe was cyclical. And at the end of the time, at the end of time, when the universe would die, it would kind of burn in fire and then be reborn again. And but that's, I think, more universal to the Greeks um, as far as other, but it's weird because I, I, I don't think that necessarily, maybe they just didn't have it. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I heard of this, um, this idea of uh, the, I, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> so I have to disappoint you there. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I heard, I heard of this idea. Um, I just had one um, thought as well um, while you were talking, um, which is maybe um, they, uh, uh, when, when you said that's maybe just an academical problem. Thanks, Chetan. Um, uh, we'll see you. Have a have a good night. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, which is that um, just like uh, Socrates didn't write anything down, right? It was all his, uh, his students writing stuff. And I can imagine someone like a cynic um, being opposed to the idea of writing his ideas down. Uh, right, because you need to have, like, even just from the basic idea of, oh, you need to have pen and paper in order to be able to write something down, and that's that's already too much, right? So they would most certainly have been uh, not, uh, yeah, not not the ones to write their thoughts down. So they wouldn't have left much behind for us to to go off of. So the fact that um, the yeah, that, that that this could be a research problem uh, probably also goes back to the fact that they probably didn't leave very much for us to um, to study, and the stuff that is left behind about them is probably left behind by people that were um, annoyed at the likes of Diogenes for the oh, day he goes again like uh, you know acting like a dog in, in public and um, so talking about them uh, rather than um, talking um, or, or, or telling you know object or semi objectively um, what they would actually have believed but rather like what we would have left uh, with historically is probably more gossip related. Mm. So, uh, what are the th third-party sources available on um, cynicism? Who are the big external authors that we can look at for some contemporary? Um, I, I found actually a, a, an online database, an online website that hosts a lot of the. Um, uh, here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll just put it. I'll put it in the. Um, uh, in the comments section. Uh, I couldn't find this on the usual sources you find for Stoicism, like um, the wiki, uh, the wikis or, or, or the classics, um, those two sites. But uh, this site does have a lot of the original writings um, for the cynics, a bunch. What I can basically tell you is that looking, just even looking through these, uh, that the at the names of these, uh, you don't. There's there's no direct sources. Crates and Diogenes, the base, arguably the two most um, important cynics, yeah. didn't write anything. And if they did write anything, we would have nothing from them. The only one I know that we have, that we know, um, wrote a lot. And I think he's, although he, I think he's a lot like. Sino, in the sense that he wrote a lot, but we don't have a lot from him still, is Antisthenes, the founder of cynicism. Um, I don't think he, I don't think we have anything from him. I think all those sources are just commentaries of him. Um, uh, so I don't think there's any direct sources from cynicism. That might be why there's a huge gap in understanding cynicism versus stoicism, because we just don't have any direct sources from Antisthenes, Crates, or or Diogenes, the three main three main cynics. So there's a subject for your um, doctorate there, Steve. Sorry? Do one. There's a subject for your doctorate, if you'd like to do one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, yeah, there, there's a, that's a, um, I think we just found an academics, uh, <laughs> uh, an academic vacancy. If anybody can write a PhD on cynicism, they, they have a whole field to themselves. <laughs> exactly. You're automatically the, um, the global authority. Yeah. <laughs> I was interested also in the influence on early Christianity. 
of um, of cynicism, because there seems to be a, quite a lot of um, overlap, not only from Stoicism to Christianity, but cynicism as well. Um, do you know any more about that? Um, not really, but um, I would imagine that, the, like, um, especially in early um, Christianity, the the idea of the the hermit um, was um, it probably traces also at least like indirectly perhaps back to it. Um, but I'm, I'm pure conjecture. I'm just like um, I I'm not aware of any direct um, influence. But um, I also I don't know of any other um, um, other group of people um, that were living as aesthetically as um, the, mm. the cynics were at around that time. So that would probably have um, been an influence um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that um, there's that section you probably read in, in Wikipedia about comparing cynicism and, and the, a, a common cynic ascetic back then in, in Jesus. Um, but um, uh, I tried going down that rabbit hole. I looked at a few Wikipedia pages. I looked through actually just typing in Google, finding different sources. Um, and um, I, what, what came up was also um, what they call the cynic epistles. Um, uh, these collections of, of writings about cynicism, which again, doesn't is not from the original authors, but they're supposedly written from people who either knew or knew people who knew the original cynics and had written down their ideas. Um, and I believe the the common there's an idea that these cynic epistles kind of helped to uh, um, influence the, the the main. That's why they're called the cynic epistles. Is that they kind of feel like a bible of cynicism. Um, these collection of writings, and so they they might have influenced. Um, uh, Christian idea of a body of works that summarizes um, the Christian uh, religion. But as far beyond that, I don't know. No idea. Um, because, I mean, the, the, the extent to which of little I've read of the comparison, for example, between Jesus and cynicism is as much I've, as I've seen between Jesus and stoicism. Like, it's, uh, yeah. But it's also that surprising that um that this um that you would have found like similar amounts of, of detail because at, like on a, on a superficial level um they are quite similar stoicism and, and cynicism um actually um, when you pointed out this little um i, I hadn't seen it when i skimmed the article uh, on wikipedia about um uh, what you mentioned uh, jesus as a um as a cynic that's super interesting and um the first thing that um when when i um, skimmed this was coming to my head was this idea that um i think somewhere in the bible it says that um what was it about the camel and the the needle and the rich man um so it's, it's, it's more likely for a poor person to go to heaven than it is uh no well you, you know what i mean like i i i know how it is in german i don't know how it exactly is in, in, in the bible but you know what i mean like the um so the, the focus on poverty um, being um, conductive to virtue and conductive to having a good life or living a, a good life. So there's um, also this. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say there's also this sort of underlying um, ever present notion of frugality between the two as well. You know, I think wealth in Christianity was sort of frowned upon, certainly in the early days anyway. Although Paul, I understand, wasn't such a poor man. Um, sort of second generation Christian. Um, but it's interesting though, I mean, it's interesting for, for me personally because I've brought up with Christianity and it's always sort of positioned itself as the ultimate authority. And I would be interested to hear or to, to, to research actually if there's any elements of plagiarism um, be, between Stoic writings, Cynic writings and Biblical writings in some way. Um, I'm not saying that there is, but it'd be interesting to find out if there was. So I might take a look at that this week. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually 
um, the, the more we do this, the more, I, more I'm interested in the relationship between how early philosophies like cynicism, stoicism influenced Christianity or other religions. I'd be really interested because um, it, it's uh, even the way in which it's written, like you said, Tony, it's, it's just seems so similar. Like Epictetus, the very beginning of Epictetus is Enchiridion. There are some things you can't control and other things you, you can't within your control or, or vice versa. Um, and it's uh, those kind of nice, short um, uh, idiom, uh, not idioms, um, um, aphorisms that sound a little bit like the way in which uh, the Bible evangelizes very small um, aphorisms. Um, uh, you're also right, the, the, the idea of material wealth um, is frowned upon. Um, uh, I, I just posted a source. So there seems to be some academic literature more than just, so Wikipedia does, is, is taking from some sources. Um, this is just one of them that I found just typing a basic search, Jesus and cynicism. And there is, there is some academic research into understanding if Jesus was more influenced by cynicism than has, is typically perceived. Um, because he did grow up uh, and if, um, if if Jesus was in some way a real figure, then he was he was basically living right basically in the middle of the Hellenistic period, more in the late period part of it, but still in, still in the in, still in the midst of when these philosophies were still current. And so um, uh, this this article, which looks like um, a note, you can't you can't download it unless you're you're registered. Um, but if you can find it online, this seems like a really good, like he does a basically a, a, just a, a summary of all the historical um, analysis of it. What is this from 1990, yeah, 1994, um, but it would still be interesting. That is actually, yeah, definitely. Um, and if you draw um, parallels between, um, you know, the life that um, Jesus lived um, according to um, how how we're told about it in the Bible, you know, as a poor man without uh, owning, um, uh, yeah, material possessions, um, wandering around, uh, teaching, um, upsetting um, the ruling class with what he's saying, similar to um, to the cynics at the time, um, or. I don't know if it's exactly the, the same time, but around the same time. I don't know, like I, I don't know when the, the cynic school fizzled out of existence, but I believe it was a little bit before um, the um, before the time of Jesus. But you yeah, know, like um, on, on the surface level, you're right, Tony. There's like some some really interesting parallels um, that never really um, occurred to me. It seems like from you know, the New Testament, that Jesus was influenced not only by the contemporary conditions of the day, the Romans invading, and oh, sorry, the um, Romans being in, in, in that part of the Middle East and things like that, but also by sort of the want to negate the Old Testament as well, and to bring in something new. You know, I think that's, cynicism was quite radical as well. You know, it was, a, it was a, quite a departure from the accepted norms. So there does seem to be some real similarities, but as I say, I mean, uh, just on a personal level, it'd be interesting to see if there's any direct, not word for word, not necessarily plagiarism, but you know, this notion is definitely from this writing and that's unequivocal. Um, I'm gonna take a look anyway this week. Yeah. The, the big difference, of course, between um, Hellenic, uh, Hellenistic philosophy and uh, uh, Christianity is the idea that um, uh we in, in the hellenistic philosophy we are um capable of our own salvation whereas in christianity we are dependent on the salvation of um that that, that we're um i don't know if granted is the right word but um we are being saved by uh mm. the the lord whereas um yeah mm. I think I think that's a good point. As much as as much as it's interesting to, um, I think it's it really be interesting to go down that rabbit hole because it also it also makes us question. Like there, there there was there was another question I had on my I had on my list of questions to discuss today, and one of them was the extent to which um, you can still call yourself uh, a, a, a stoic 
by after you start subtracting parts of the philosophy, same thing with cynic. In order to kind of question, like to what extent are, are you a cynic versus a stoic? If you start accepting part of their philosophies, I think you do the same thing with Christianity. Like, what's the extent to which you're a Christian but not a stoic, or a stoic but not a Christian? I think that's a really defining feature um, that uh, um, uh, Tony pointed out. That um, uh, no, it was, it was, it was, or it was Philip just now who, uh, this idea of salvation, this idea that you, you basically, um, um, uh, in Stoicism, the only person who can be, who's, who's responsible for being virtuous for yourself is yourself. You are responsible for yourself to be and mm -hmm. act and, and think virtuously. Whereas in Christianity, um, you can always blame it on the devil or you can always ask for forgiveness. And um, I think that's a, huge difference i think that's if, if if you believe one versus the other then you can kind of tell if you're going to be more of a stoic than a, than a christian um than a christian follower um i think that's also part of the reason why um stoicism endured for um for such a relatively long time like um at least in the classical period is like what spans about 600 years much longer than um most other schools um is that it's very compatible with a lot of other belief systems. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so, so it's easy to um, adapt it to, you know, old Hellenistic um, religions as it is to um, Christianity and find uh, common ground. And I, I, um, we talked about this before, how Seneca was uh, co-opted um, by the early, um, uh, the early church fathers. Um, so I think that's, that's that's part of the appeal why it's still uh, a part of the reason for its appeal and also part of the reason why it's so well researched and probably also why it's still um, actively practiced today. Like I don't know anybody who's um, a cynic today or a um, uh, Epicurean or um, peripatetic academic, whatever, um, you know what I mean, um, but there are Stoics still to this day, um, and that's because it is still compatible with our um, with our life, and it has been um, in, in in the most ways um, over the past two and a half thousand years. So this seems to be so, Steve. I, I was just going to quickly point out there is a modern Epicureanism movement. There, I, there's not as there's not a larger of a one as there is for Stoicism. Like Stoicism has a formal nonprofit modern Stoicism organization. Epicureanism doesn't have that, but Epicureans do have like a a, a network of of not Stoas but Epicureans. They have a system of of Epicurean chapters around the world. Not as many as Stoicism, but I just wanted to point out that um, I can't speak for cynicism, but for Stoicism, mm -hmm. they do have some around the world. Cool. Huh? Um. Um, did you come upon that uh, when when you were uh, researching the um, uh, discussions on Epicureanism? Because I, I missed those, unfortunately. Or I think. Oh, I think I um, yeah. Well, uh, actually, who? Um, uh, God, I forget who pointed me in the right direction. I believe I was talking to uh, somebody at the Stoic Fellowship, and I was asking because it was one, the first or second um, discussion during Epicure our Epicureanism events, and um, uh, one of the actually one of the regular members at the time who who hasn't appeared for for a couple months now, um, uh, he had asked if we could maybe kind of join forces with an Epicurean group to kind of talk about the subject of Stoicism versus Epicureanism. And I found one that I couldn't find um, too many of them because uh, doing a search is difficult. They're definitely rare. And um, I found it through the Stoic Fellowship. I asked them if they know of any Epicurean group and they, the only Epicurean group they founded was in Australia. It's, it would be difficult to set up a time where we can both meet because of, our, of our, the time difference. Um, but it would really be interesting to kind of have a discussion with them because uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I really like to under like it, it's it's more than just to just you know it's it's really a, a pure interest in understanding why not not like as an is a kind of an offensive but like what makes you so attracted to Epicureanism or versus what makes you so unattracted to Stoicism 
like what is it about it? And um, um, it'd be a really interesting discussion for them to ask us as well, because we can, I think we can really, from a first person perspective, what is it about Epicureanism and not Stoicism that attracts them? Because we, we're very, we're very head, head fast about this idea of Stoicism and it's a big thing about indifference and cosmopolitanism be these defining features. So, but um, I would be interested to understand um, from an Epicurean mm -hmm. point of view, if, if those defining, some of those defining features are kind of deal breakers and, and why. Um, For sure, big time. Yeah, but there's not, there's not a huge movement. There's maybe a few around the world that I've seen and only, only a handful on meetup that I can find anywhere in the world. It's, they're, they're hard um, to find. Um, um, I, I don't know if it may be a part of the philosophy that is kind of antithetical to group organization at a, at a massive extent. I think Stoicism promotes that, whereas Epicureanism actually tells you to recede from public life. So I'm, I'm not sure to an extent, but maybe that's, maybe, maybe they will start, um, uh, like, like in Stoicism in certain respects, maybe Epicureanism would start forming its own modern movement and modern interpretation where it allows for certain public or, or community involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, I wanted to come back to you because I know you were trying to say something before and, and, I, and I stopped you. What, if you had anything to say? Yeah, no, we're just talking about the overlap between Christianity and, and Stoicism. But I, I think um, generally, you know, to take something which is very reasonable and logical, which Stoicism is, and to try and marry it to sort of supernatural beings that live in an ethereal world is quite a task. And Christianity seems to have done it quite successfully. Um, so I'm just wondering how that happened as well. You know, if they did steal, if they did steal um, any sort of tenets from Stoicism, why was that? And how did they manage to marry it to this sort of seemingly fantasy world, which doesn't exist? It just seems to be really polarized to me, but they've successfully done it somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that <laughs> because I, I, I'm not sure I know. Um, but, um, I think one, um, interesting avenue for you to go down if you're interested in that is like I said, um, like how the, um, early church fathers adopted um, Seneca in particular um, because um, he was uh, still considered a heathen, but he was one of the one of the good ones, let's say. Right? Um, and um, I'm, I'm not, let me, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find something that I read about it. Give me one second. Uh, please carry on with the Discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find some. Um, we have. Um, uh, I'm just wondering now. I'm just. I'm just thinking. But um, I guess while you're searching for more technical, so our, our next two meetups will be on. Um, as as Philip already suggested, we're going to do some one on, on Buddhism next Thursday, and then on Taoism. Um, but then we could also do something in Christianity if we want. We could do an entire episode because um, we did that already. But I feel like when I when we had done it, uh, I I only we only scratched the surface. Probably like Buddhism, so we could probably do a bit more. Um, a bit more on it. Yeah, I remember you mentioned this, uh, Philip. This uh, this connection between the, the early letters. I actually saw a. Um, I, I'll, I'll let I'll let you continue in a second. But just just as a reference, uh, if you do look at like the um, the connections, for example, between cynicism and, and Christianity, like in the article from JSTOR I, I've shared before, there there is this theory that the um, in the New Testament, the books by, I think it's Matthew and Luke or Mark and Luke, they, they, some of their, some of the references don't appear anywhere else. And there's theories that some of their writings look similar to some of the philosophers mentioned in Diogenes Laertius's like compendium of, of philosophers he wrote. And um, so there is a theory that he, there is, there's, there, there are missing sources we don't know about that he he took from that, that Christianity took from. So, um, but yeah, go go on, uh, Philip. Uh, this uh, um, this connection you met, I, I know you mentioned before. It might have been the last time actually we did something on on Christianity. I, I don't know the the context in which, but um, 
yeah, I'd say this is a good starting point. Um, and um, I think it was um, in part to um, sort of lend a little bit of, um, you know, credibility, history, and like a, a person with uh, some weight and a name uh, to the uh, nice, nascent uh, early Christian church. Um, and actually, um, Seneca's brother is mentioned in the New Testament. Um, he appears in the um, uh, um, he he was the governor of um, Jerusalem or, uh, of Judea at the time, not um, Pontius, of course. Um, but he's mentioned in like an in, in, um, offhand remark. So um, it's an interesting tidbit, and um, yeah, like like I can't I can't say much more about it except that um, it's definitely. Um, a very very like interesting connection. I actually now want to uh, dig into this again because it's such 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 a such a weird um, uh, yeah connection. Mm, I, it was um, yeah. It's uh, it kind of also explains a little bit of Christianity. Like Judaism had been around for longer than the philosophy these philosophies had so um they definitely didn't come from these philosophies uh maybe there's a connection to um islam but i think islam came way too late to be really influenced by these philosophies um uh but with with christianity it just came around at the perfect time i mean it came around when these philosophies were not at their height but they were still around and they were still popular to an extent especially stoicism so it it may not just be like a coincidence or an influence. It may be kind of part explanation, at least maybe not stoicism or cynicism specifically, but like the Hellenistic, um, some of the similarities between the Hellenistic philosophies um, probably can help explain why um, or how Christianity became um, became influential. Um, I mean, they added the they added Judaic values in there. Uh, and, Primarily from from if you if you they wanted to take from any other religion, um, but um, and then obviously there was a pagan influence, um, but then they basically embellished it with these philosophical attitudes and probably explains also why Christianity there was a huge 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 rise in Christian conversions as well. I'm not sure, but it, it might might be it might be an explanation if we read more into the academic uh, research on it. I think the whole notion of um, a savior who rises from the dead on the third day, and it, it's nothing new. I mean, it, it, it's been there, you know, from, from time immemorial, really. I think there was a, an ancient Egyptian god who did the same. So there's several examples of that happening. So it, it seems like Christianity at that time somehow revived um, that notion and used it to, to advantage somehow. Um, but yeah, I mean, there does seem to be similarities historically. You know, it's it's a perfect fit. Um, so I'm looking forward to your thesis, Steve. Well, it'd be a few years coming. I have to, uh, to start applying to some programs, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really it's like a. Um, uh, but the, the the more I feel like that, the more I feel like there is this gap in cynicism. Maybe I'll do my thesis on that. I'll hold, I'll hold it off to that. Um, I think there's all. It's, it feels like there's a good basis for research between the Hellenistic philosophies and Christianity already. Um, just touching upon the surface, um, it feels like there is a depth to it that we haven't looked at yet that researchers have done. So um, I think there's also going to be always a kind of a ceiling on it as long as we don't have the historical record we're not going to go any deeper um but i'm interested in more of the analysis so um yeah it really it really sucks that i am um, uh that we don't have a um uh if if anybody if anybody you or you know has a um access to jstor or kind of some academic um database like that let me know. It'd be interesting to like to just to pull a few sources from there for us to read. Um, 
but uh, any any resources you guys have, maybe I'll create or or if one of you guys want to create like a section in the um, in the form on our website um, and uh, just for Christianity and Stoicism or Christianity and the Hellenistic philosophies, we can just start posting references and links to that. We can go down the rabbit hole there. I'm I'm just trying to find. Um, I am signed up to a place. Um, where a lot of um, academic uh, work is published uh, for public access. Um, and I do get like emails every once in a while, like, hey, you might be interested in that. There's a lot of stuff from um, John Sellers, for example, um, not whole books, but like, um, you know, dissertations on um, some uh, topic or another, but I can't find it right now. Mm. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to like, I, I, yeah, if, if you do find it, let us know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think that's a weird gray area I've always found in academia. The I know I know academics, philosophers, and scientists alike do attempt to publish these things for free, and even there's there, there are certain extreme cases where they do that. Um, but it's it's kind of interesting because they're they're the ones publishing it for free, but uh, it's the uh, it's the uh, academic journal journals that are that that don't want that. They're that they're. Um, um, they want to preserve this um, um, pay paywall, um, and I really find it encouraging that they're yeah academia. Academia, I've heard of. Oh, oh, so you have an account, and you do you get you get regular updates for that. I don't have an account. Um, I don't have an account. I mean, I have an account, but just to be able to download the PDFs, but you don't need to pay anything. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I do get uh, regular emails with like, um, you know, this might be up your alley, might be interested in that. And I have like a whole folder of, um, yeah, PDFs that I downloaded. And I know I'll never get to reading them, but um, I'm like a, I'm like a hoarder. Like at some point, maybe I'll get to it. Might be useful, but I know I never will. It's uh, it's nice we have this digital universe now. You know, we don't have to. Uh, uh, we can just shore up gigabytes worth of data and not have to worry about ever getting to it. And... <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We never, you know, you put it out of mind, put it out of, uh, put it out of uh, time to read. It's certainly yeah. anti cynic. I can say that. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good cynic interpretation. A good modern cynic wouldn't use the internet, would they? No. All this unnecessary unnecessary gigabytes being used. No more. <laughs> um. I, I I have nothing else to say about cynicism. <laughs> there's there's nothing more I can really say. I think the extent to which you can study cynicism and the extent to which we did, uh, there might be a little bit more, but as Tony said, there's a PhD in it for me. So <laughs> if, if I discuss it anymore, there won't be any more money for it for me. So. <laughs> um, are you actually working on a dissertation, Steve? Or no. <laughs> as of tonight, as of tonight, yes. as of tonight yeah. <laughs> we, we signed you up. <laughs> if you ask me if there's any research on cynicism, I'll say no. <laughs> no, five fair. years there will be, but no. <laughs> um, so, uh, kind of just to review, so the next the next few weeks, um, uh, kind of just wrap things up. So, Buddhism, our discussion on Buddhism and Stoicism next Thursday will kind of be like a trial Thursday to see if there's. I, I hope that there's more people. I just have this feeling that it sounded like there was a consensus people were okay with Thursday at 6.30. And at the same time, I hope there's a, maybe a few more people who have always wanted to come to a discussion but may, might usually be busy on the weekends because they're out doing things. So I'm hoping there might be a little bit, of, a, a little bit more um, interest or different interest on Thursdays, but we'll see. The following Saturday, which I think is the first day we're gonna have a meetup in June, so that's, yeah, Saturday the 5th will be on Taoism. Uh, we could do the following one on Christianity. Um, and um, then that covers the next three weeks because the week after that, so the, the big date I wanted to mention, we um, uh, on Sunday the 20th, that weekend, I just posted the event, is a guest appearance by Kai Whiting. So I know, I know Tony, we, we, we were talking about Don Robertson and we said, you know what, not right now. The respect, the reception I got from Kai was very welcoming, 
Uh, we don't yes. have to, we, we don't have to go into your discussion about Donald Robertson. We are we are recording at this point, but um, I will say that when I spoke to Kai, he he was a little bit more regardless of uh, um, disregarding of the group size. He just uh, he was more encouraging me. I, I also just I also told him that this would be a regional event. So if you guys come, we're also going to have some participants from around the region. So I've contacted other uh, the Stoic group in Hanover. The facilitator said he'd promote the event and he'd come. There's a in all in in Algoy in um, uh, um, um, Bavaria. Uh, he said he'll talk to his very small and group that he basically just started a few weeks ago. I'm trying to contact some other German groups. The Stoic, the main Stoic Netherlands group also said he'd be interested. Um, so there's, it's a regional event. So there'd be a, there'd be a sizable, um, a much more sizable attendance than we're used to. Um, so I really do encourage everybody to come mm -hmm. and to, um, and to buy his book. I, um, uh, um, I think it'd really be a service to him that if, if um, to encourage the people to buy it as well um, and to use it because it, it, anybody who's interested in stoicism, this is probably a really good book to start with. Um, and um, just to, to lastly mention one last thing, um, I realized that I should have been doing this, um, but anytime you guys come to an event, even if it's the day of, if you guys can just formally RSVP, so I have this, I'm, I just, I really just thought about it today. I'm wondering if there's kind of an aesthetic influence people have, like they consciously see two or three people signed up and there's like, eh, it's a small group. I'm not going to go today. Um, I wonder if maybe in, in increasing our RSV, the RSVP list, the, the guest list at the meet on the meetup events might help look better for the group might might encourage people to come so if you guys can um i know you guys know when the meetups are every day every, every week um but just just click rsvp that you're going on the meetup event um on the website will be great too but the more the one i'm more focused on is the meetup one i think that's what i think most people are going to see so if you can and meet up um just if you are going um just just formally rsvp um that would be fantastic. I think that would help just look better for the group when people see all these events coming up with a lot of people showing up. So. Sure. I'm, I'm not actually on Meetup, but um, I used to be. I'm not anymore. But, uh, Is that? I forgot. Did you did you find the group on, on Meetup or did you find our website first? Um, yeah, it was Meetup actually. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just look for the nearest Stoic group. And I think there's actually one in Poland, but unfortunately, my Polish is quite rudimentary. Um, like my like my English, um, so I thought it up for the uh, for the Berlin group because obviously it's English based. Um, how how good is your Polish? Um, I just started learning it again. Naprawdę? Huh? <laughs> I only speak a little bit of uh, uh, yeah. Polish. Yeah. Um, how, why yeah. are you learning Polish? No? Uh, my girlfriend is Polish. Oh. Oh, my wife is yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. yeah, she's she's soon to be my wife. Um, we're getting married in August. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Many congratulations. And I wanted to ask you as well. I've my my family's Irish. Was brought up in a, in a sort of Irish environment. Do I detect a, an Irish accent? I've lived in Dublin for about ten years. My goodness. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, because my, yeah. my my Irish sort of DNA was tingling a few times <laughs> where you was, you said a few little bits yeah. and bobs. Yeah? yeah. Oh, so you're in yeah. Dublin now? No, I'm I am in Berlin. Like I moved to Berlin ah. um, about a year and a half ago. Ah, I um, see. And before that, I was in in Dublin for ten non consecutive years. So um, I I think I moved to Dublin about five times and then four times, and I moved away five times. <laughs> um, every time okay. I was like, okay, I I. You have to learn by your mistakes, Phil. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I keep repeating them though. <laughs> no, um, I, I left uh, Germany when, yeah, after after, after high school, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And then I lived in Ireland for two years, kind of got tired of it, went traveling for a bit, ran out of money. Um, I knew uh, if I moved back to Ireland, um, I have friends where I can crash on the couch without having to worry about paying rent, and I know I can find a job easily. And so, I always kind of the same cycle. I was like, okay, I'll try to move away. Something didn't work out. I ended up going back. Um, uh, so yeah, I lived in in, in in Dublin in 
in Krakow actually for a couple of months. Um, I lived in Italy for a year, um, mm. and the other two times I was uh, just traveling the world um, for a couple of months at a time. And every time it kind of just worked out in a way that I ended up back in Dublin somehow. And then now, I guess a year and a half ago, we finally settled in Berlin. Fantastic, and a great city, Berlin is too. Yeah. I wish I was there myself. <laughs> you're, um, I, I, I remember that you said you're in Poland, but I can't remember where. Yeah, not far from Poznan. Okay. Yeah. So it's about a four hour drive. We actually went to Berlin a couple of years ago, just drove over. I really love yeah. Berlin. It's one of the few cities where I feel that like I could settle. Yeah, yeah it's I amazing. feel at home in Berlin. Yeah, yeah. it's just a cool place. Um, yeah, it's one of those cities that's like, it's, it's really like, it's urban, but the way in which the city's designed, especially the fact that you really don't have skyscrapers in Berlin, mm -hmm. and this low-lying feel, this more community-like urban feel is yeah. really, really, I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. What part of uh, Berlin do you like to see? Now in Kreuzberg, on Urbanstrasse, like right down the street from Hermannplatz. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm out in um, uh, Schöneweide, so uh, just behind Treptower Park. Mm -hmm. um, I really like is um, it's not so difficult to get to the center, um, but also I, I literally uh, like within a ten minute walk I have a massive forest, two parks, and um, it is uh, yeah nice and nice and quiet. So like like you said like you know like it does feel like you're still living in a city, but at the same time you have like some of the the benefits of not being um, yeah super central. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I moved here, I lived basically right, right right around the corner from Hermannplatz, and that was awful. Hermannplatz is that it's not it's not city center, but it feels like it's the center of that part of the city. It's awful. I hate I hate Hermannplatz. I hate <laughs> it. It's it's just way too congested, way too congested. Um, uh, but I'm like I feel like I'm in the perfect location, right across the, right right basically a block away from Hassenheide. Um, so it's oh, still nice. away from like a nice park and and, and yeah. Yes. You're a New York boy, Steve. Is that right? Yeah. You don't yeah. have a New York accent. I probably lost it. I probably lost it. <laughs> probably lost it. There you go. You did. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I don't. Great. I don't know to the extent to which I, which I've. Uh, when I went back home, uh, I had an aunt who told me who who was born in Berlin. By the way, she's she was born and raised in Berlin, so she she I, I she's probably the expert on understanding whether or not I have an accent. But a year and a half ago, I, I visited my family just before the pandemic, and I saw her for for Christmas. And she said, "You know, you don't have an accent, but your your speech is different. Your speech is a bit I don't more paced. Not not. Um, I've also noticed this too. Sometimes I I I'm a bit more patient or hesitant with what I say, and I I, I drag that I drag that along. Maybe that's just a a byproduct of uh, speaking to." Maybe other people whose second language is English or speaking as much German as I can with my girlfriend. Um, mm -hmm. And but uh, I don't think I have a German accent. I don't think I ever will. I think that's like a it's a weird thing. Like uh, um, Philip, you have this. I, I do notice. I have noticed it before. This this slight Irish accent. But I think I think to an extent, if I lived here for a full ten years and now I'm in my fourth year, I don't think I would really get that kind of. German accent to the extent that you've gotten the Irish one. There's something about maybe the pervasiveness of English mm. all around me, uh, especially in Berlin, that there's not really an ability to get that German accent, unless I just spoke German 100% of the time. No, I, I think, um, I, I don't think you would, like English is your first language. And like, for me, it's like picking up an accent to my second language, right? So mm. I, I like, even, even after living in Ireland for such a long time, I. Like my German accent never really changed, even though I hardly spoke German anymore. But like my 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 grammar and my vocabulary went down the drain. Like I, when I came back here, um, I sounded like a bumbling idiot trying to speak German again for the first time after so many years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, not for a while. Um, I could pass for um, an Irish citizen, like. Um, when when I first moved there, I made it a habit of trying to you know like listen very closely to speech patterns and, and the accent of the person I'm speaking to, and subconsciously I was imitating who I'm speaking to. So if I, even today, like when I'm speaking to somebody with a very strong strong accent, um, 
I, I do tend to imitate it subconsciously. And it's even as far as um, like watching TV shows as I watch. Um, my girlfriend always makes fun of me for when we watch Game of Thrones and um, there's, uh, I don't know, somebody from the North uh, um, saying whatever. Like, I, I don't say I'm going to the car anymore, um, but I go to the car. <laughs> the car. <laughs> so I was making fun of me for that, but it's not, it's not conscious. It's not like I'm trying to, you know, imitate the way people speak. It's just that when I first moved there, I was like a bit conscious about the way that I speak. So I was paying very close attention and then it developed into the subconscious habit of um, just paying really close attention to how, how people speak. And um, mm. uh, yeah, so like for, for a long time, I would have actually like, my, my accent was way stronger, way, way stronger. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that makes sense. The, the the difference between the second and first language, like I, I noticed that I don't have a Berlin accent. That's because where I teach in Brandenburg, I speak with a lot of teachers uh, in German, but they, they're they from Brandenburg and that they don't live in Berlin. So I naturally, if I spoke, if I spoke German, I would probably have a more, as my girlfriend has told me, definitely not a Berlin accent. She's actually <laughs> thought I, I sound more like I, I probably am better off in, in Hamburg, but not um, not in Berlin. I that's, a very pleasant, um, that's a very pleasant accent of um, Hamburg. Okay. This is, it's close to where I'm from, so like, I, can, I can get with that. Uh, so, uh, it's good chatting with you guys, though. I thought about it, like as the weather gets up, it gets better. Um, we should we should do a few more, maybe even virtually, because I'm. But I am I am watching out for. Um, and who knows? Maybe maybe Tony, you can make the, the drive over one one month mm -hmm. in the next few months. That um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm still keeping tabs with the um, the regulations. So this pack, like just yesterday, they started letting restaurants in Berlin open up where you can have um, you can have drinks outside. Uh, but I still think, and the curfew is over, but I still think um, you can technically only meet with one other person from another household. So I don't think it's, we're, I have to check the regulations again. So I'm not sure we're not at that point where we can meet outside yet, but it's coming. It just feels like the innocence rate has been steadily dropping and very consistently. So it feels like it might come in the next month. We might have an ability to, to do something outside again, maybe a, um, a hike together, um, a drink together outside, a drink together. It would be nice for a first meeting outside to do something a bit more casual than a formal discussion like this, because I think we just need that. Um, we could just take a cynic standpoint and just not worry what the authorities say. <laughs> and just all of us just meet up and have a party. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, we'll just we'll just call ourselves the cynic philosophy club instead of the stoic. Exactly for that occasion. Completely shameless. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'll see you guys next Thursday then. Yes, absolutely. Have a great week, um, chaps. Yes. Likewise. Uh, too, and thanks again for um, organizing, as always. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, so. Steve. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah. You see too. you soon. Okay. See, see you guys. guys. Bye.